December December session of MyTechU where we're going to be talking about enabling your mobile workforce. Um, we have a very special uh, uh, person that's going to be presenting today, uh, Matt Diekman. Um, and the reason why I say that is because he is the product manager for SonicWell. He owns this product from a standpoint of, of uh, just all the aspects of it. And so he's probably one of the best people in the world to be able to give this information and deliver this content to us today. So I'm thankful for everyone who's, been, who's uh, on, in attendance. And uh, please take advantage of uh, being able to ask Matt questions throughout the presentation as uh, we've, we've got one of the best resources we're ever going to find here uh, with this content. So um, with that said, thank you everyone for attending. Again, we're going to have about a 30-minute presentation and a little bit of a 15 minutes Q&A at the end. And uh, with that, Matt uh, from SonicWall, please take it away. Thanks, Nate. Just uh, one question for you. Can you see the presentation? The presentation is online. I see it. Bye. Perfect. That's what I need to verify. Thanks, Nate. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, as Nate mentioned, my name is Matthew Deakman. I am one of the product managers uh, here at SonicWall. Uh, my main responsibility is for uh, SonicWall Secure Remote Access Platforms. What I wanted to do is spend about the next 30 minutes kind of talking high level um, about some of the changes that we've seen in the kind of in IT industry and some of the trends that we're seeing as it relates to uh, mobile devices and the effect that's had on, you know, the requirements to provide remote access to um, a larger user population, and kind of um, wind that back in with what we're, you know, what we're seeing in the marketplace is called the consumerization of, of IT, and kind of how that's changed um, the market uh, market for how IT is managing systems um, in general. You know, if you look at uh, most companies in the world, um, a lot of them have standardized on uh, a Windows platform. It's very rare that um, you would not see at least some form of a, a Windows-based system within an organization, um, you know, whether it's IT managed or uh, delivered via, you know, the end user. Uh, most businesses, I would say, or a large population of businesses have actually standardized um, on Windows as their main platform for um, usage. And there's a lot of good reasons, um, you know, to do that. There's a lot of integration with things like, you know, Active Directory and Office and SharePoint and, a lot of other applications that Microsoft um, does provide via the Windows platform. One of the changes that we're starting to see, um, you know, that that uh, companies can't ignore um, is the fact that you know the Mac OS is continuing to, um, you know, really drive adoption. And things like you know iOS are really trying to drive adoption into um, more of the organizations or enterprises and small businesses, right? A lot of companies utilize Macs. A lot of companies utilize iOS-enabled devices, right? You can't just say that, oh, you know, we're just a Windows-only shop. And that reality is long gone. Um, and, and, and the employees are really what's driving this. Is that they're determining that, hey, you know, I don't really or I'm not as productive using a Windows system as I might be using a Mac system. And so I want to make sure that you know, being a, as productive as possible, um, you know, I, I, I will try to drive that through IT. And a lot of it has come from, you know, the C-level um, executives and VP-level executives that are really driving the adoption of the cross-platform situation. Or if you look in a lot of education and other types of, of um, markets geared more towards uh, the Mac OS, you know, they're cross-platform as well, where they may have some Windows-based systems, but a lot of their systems also rely um, on Mac OS as well. And then you look at the iPads, you know, are continuing to grow. Um, the use of tablet devices in general um, is continuing to explode in the marketplace, whether it be Android or, um, you know, Apple in this case. What we've seen from, you know, the SonicWall side is a lot of organizations, uh, whether it be in the healthcare industry, financial, uh, or even uh, sales of certain uh, types of industry, we're starting to see customers actually build their own applications for iOS-specific tablet devices. So they no longer send their salespeople out with a, you know, a clunky laptop running Windows, uh, but the customer can utilize their iOS-enabled device and basically provide the customer information, use their CRM package, potentially punch in order information, patient record information if you're a doctor, and basically utilize this as more of, you know, to replace a lot of the, um, you know, paper that they had carried around or charts that they had carried around in the past. I, I read uh, a couple weeks ago where a company that manufactured locks um, basically had 40, the guy had 40 pounds of, of uh, manuals that they had to carry around. Well, this company created an application for their, their iPads and basically no longer 
that sales rep have to carry around 40 pounds of manuals, but they could actually use the interactive application built for their iPad to basically show a lot of the data um, and information they traditionally would have used a catalog for. So again, we're starting to see businesses migrate um, you know, onto more of the tablet devices. Again, iPhones are growing. Um, I believe they're number two in the marketplace um, behind only Android in terms of uh, the number of phones that are being sold by Apple directly. You know, a lot of people um, probably on this call actually have an iPhone, uh, probably utilize it on a daily basis, not only to play things like Angry Birds, but also to utilize it for email, uh, phone calls, and, and basic business connectivity. So you are you know, have all the information or most of the information that you would need you know, right at your fingertips from, you know, a specific style of phone. And then obviously, you know, Android is in the fight as well. Um, you know, if you look at kind of the two leaders in both, I would say, the tablet slash phone market, um, you know, Android has a pretty commanding lead both on the phone side, but from the tablet standpoint, they're really behind where um, Apple is as it relates to, you know, delivering the, the iPad type of, um, and iPad 2 type devices. But Again, you know, these are the two companies that um, SonicWall has kind of chosen on the mobile side to really, um, you know, build out our solution to be able to provide, a, you know, an all-around better use case solution for both Android um, and iOS-enabled devices. But again, you know, it, it's, it's not going to go away. I believe these two um, OSs will be around for some time. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see um, what happens in, in the future here. One of the interesting things um, you know, that I've talked to people about quite a bit is the concept of the consumerization of IT. You know, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's all about being able to provide the ability to make employees more productive. And a lot of that is being driven by you know, executives and higher level uh, people at organizations saying, hey, I don't want to use a Windows device because I'm not very comfortable with it. I'd prefer to use this device and you know, I need you as IT to be able to support that. But What's really interesting is what you're seeing is that you know, the, the annual worldwide sales of mobile devices you know, will increase to 650 million units by you know, 2012. Um, interesting one that I, I thought of is by 2013, smartphone shipments will overtake PCs as the most common web access device in the world. Right? Um, in, in a very short period of time, uh, mobile devices have become very, very popular. Um, smartphones that users purchase outside of the company you know, um, need access, right? And they'll sell faster than smartphones that are uh, purchased by corporate network or corporate IT, uh, you know, people. And then, you know, analyst forecast culminations of smartphone sales of about 2.5 billion units uh, with annual uh, tablet sales reaching about 326 million units by 2015. As you can see, that's a lot of devices uh, that will need some form of access inbound uh, to a network, and there's a lot of challenges with, well, how do I secure down, you know, the communication coming from these various devices? And so I'll kind of walk you through, uh, as, you know, part of the last part of the presentation, kind of some high-level things that you can do related to SSL VPN that will help you not only deal with the explosion of devices, but also help you deal with securing down different types of devices as they come in, uh, you know, into the network. You know, as I mentioned, the consumerization of IT is here to stay. Uh, what we really see is that, you know, companies, while still issuing certain types of IT-controlled laptops, what they're starting to allow is basically that employees that have their own, you know, Mac OS or other types of, of laptops, they're starting to allow those systems to come into um, networks, whether it be, again, a tablet or, um, in this case, a laptop. They're starting to provide the freedom of picking and choosing the, the technology they use for work because, again, you know, most people today in their personal lives use some form of PC. And so if they've chosen to go with something other than a Windows-based platform, that's probably going to be the platform that they're most comfortable with as they move forward um, you know, in their work environment as well. And if you think about that, there's a couple of things that you know, happen is it specifically relates to laptops in this case, or the concept of bring your own laptop to work. Um, if you think about the challenges in, in standard operating systems for laptops, the bigger challenge is that it's uncontrolled application uh, access, meaning that employees are free to pretty much choose, pick and choose which applications that they're allowed to install on their um, laptop-specific device. So unlike a lot of the smartphones, which I'll get into, is that 
you can go to a website and basically download any application, not knowing if that application contains any kind of malware, keystroke loggers, or you know, um, maybe a non-sanctioned application for business use. And so there's a lot of challenges with, well, you know, how do I deal with that from a corporate standpoint? Then if you look at smartphones, you know, it's a little bit different. You know, the operating systems are more locked down. Um, it's not like you can just go to a website and basically install um, any type of application you want into most of the smartphones and tablets that are available um, on the market today. Most, if not all, provide some level of app store, specifically iOS and Android, where that is the primary method of um, basically being able to get applications to install on these specific systems. And then what that leads to is that a lot of these um, applications are what we consider more whitelisted because they've gone, gone through some form of review um, that actually you know, has been uh, sanctioned by the uh, owners of those specific app stores. But in general, you know, if the system is either jailbroken or in the Android case rooted, then it may be possible for uh, people to install you know, what we consider rogue applications and you know, kind of um, less likely to maintain that whitelisted application environment. And then you know, there are instances uh, specific on the Android market where Google ha did have to take down a few applications that were malware laden. Um, so that does happen from time to time. Um, so some you know, app stores are a little better at um, basically managing their specific applications, um, you know, or the specific apps that are going up on their app store. So what I wanted to run through, just kind of from a high level, is the best practices for um, kind of allowing both laptops and smartphones um, connecting from outside of the perimeter. And we actually, um, this part of the presentation came from a larger um, ebook that we've written that covers both inside and outside. And what today I wanted to focus on was more of the connection from the outside um, of the network and kind of walk you through uh, some of the things that can be done um, as it relates to, uh, you know, SSL VPN. Uh, connectivity for, again, both smartphones and laptops, and kind of some of the subtle differences um, of the technologies that could be used to help secure down um, that communication. So the first one would be to be able to at least provide some level of what we call reverse web proxy access or web access into the network. Um, what this allows would be basic web access to system resources that would be uh, contained with inside of the network perimeter. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the reverse proxy type of configuration is that it supports pretty much all web-based um, or non-complex web-based applications, and it does allow connectivity from a standard web browser. So whether you're coming in from you know, a smartphone or a laptop, we will be able to provide you access from either one of those devices, again, from either a Safari browser uh, to you know, an IE browser to a Firefox browser, depending on what system you're coming from. But again, the, the idea here is that you can set this up very easy. The user goes to a URL. They punch in a username and password. Basically, they now have access to uh, resources that they need from you know, their tablet, smartphone, or um, laptop device. It, it really you know, decreases the overhead required to provide um, connectivity to certain network resources because, again, you just set up a web portal, and you're able to access those system resources directly from there. And Matt, as you, yep. uh, before you go on to the next slide, I guess I um, just to let everybody know I published a poll um, on the on your control panel, um, which is uh, you know as a question of what mobile devices are your I guess should say is or are your are your uh, as your organization supporting today, and I kind of put Apple versus Android. Um, just curious of those you can multiple choices uh, as Matt continues the presentation. Just curious about those of you who. Uh, what, what devices are you experiencing or using? Have you solidified on one or the other? I guess that's why I was curious about asking that, uh, that poll. So um, just thought I'd interject that so we can uh, maybe weave that into the, the presentation. So go ahead. All right. Thank Thank you. All right. So the second part of this would be then, you know, for more complex applications, more, you know, server client-based applications, um, applications that are not web-enabled, for example, um, you, can you can establish an SSL VPN tunnel. And what this is is a small, uh, what we refer to as a lightweight client that provides full network level, or for more technical people, layer three connectivity back to the network. Um, again, this is to support what we re re refer to as non-web-based um, applications. It provides more of an in-office type of experience. 
uh, you know, you could you could use things like terminal server application, Citrix, VMware View, um, other types of, of uh, VDI type of solutions or, or virtual desktop infrastructure, um, and basically provide you uh, you know higher level of access. Again, there's a little bit more um, in the deployment and overhead here, but you know, again, you can um, provide this via the web portal. So in most cases, the SSL VPN client in this case can be downloaded directly from the web portal. The user basically installs that, you know, and they're ready to go um, to be able to provide access, <coughs> excuse me, inbound to that network. Now it works a little differently for, you know, apps that we have for iOS as an example. Um, in that case, the user would actually download the app directly from the app store, and that's quite simply because the distribution model uh, for a lot of the smartphones and tablet apps has changed how companies like Sonic will provide uh, their different, you know, SSL VPN client applications as well. Um, the next one, which is a very interesting one um, for a lot of our customers is, you know, as you're setting up a remote access platform, whether it terminates directly to um, a next generation firewall or is a dedicated SSL VPN appliance, uh, what we recommend is, is providing the ability to basically scan all that traffic using a next generation firewall um, type of appliance. And the reason behind this is that what we're seeing in the marketplace again is a lot of the hackers and a lot of the uh, um, threats that have happened and hacks that have happened recently you know, to companies like RSA, to companies like um, you know, Lockheed Martin and others have really been penetrated on systems that provide or systems that are not managed by those specific companies where their employees for a certain reason have been targeted via you know, these hackers that try to drop malware onto the system and leverage basically the less secure or you know, not go directly to the, you know, the com company's internet connection but utilize a backdoor into the network through VPN. And so what we can do is by just leveraging the next generation firewall, we can actually decrypt the traffic through the SSL VPN gateway and then scan that traffic using our anti-malware, anti-spyware, intrusion prevention services and then decontaminate or look for threats before they enter the network so we can prevent the potential um, inbound requests for you know, this type of malware so they're using you know, their uh, employees as a backdoor um, into the network. So, so Matt, this is, a, I guess, as a clarification point, just because I, I know that you threw some, some technical terms out there for um, some of the audience, they'll definitely understand the other parts of the audience that may or may not, so we'll offer a clarification. Sure. So, you know, when you talk about this back door, you're mainly, again, as, as the content of this webinar is that, you know, so you've got all, you've got employees that when they're in the office, right, so they're sitting down on their desk and they connect to their network resources, you're behind all of the corporate protection of the firewall and all that kind of stuff, but but then you get these employees that might go to a coffee shop or to an airport or to a, you know, at home or something like that where they're not behind the corporate protection, and so hackers are recognizing because of this increased mobility that they're, you know, planting, you know, they're they're leveraging the fact that you have you're less secure typically when you're not when you're at home or at a coffee shop, and then knowing that employees connect back over internet connections and VPN connections uh, to potentially attack. Um, so that's what you mean by kind of the back door? Yep, that's correct. Um, it's a great clarification. I mean, the, in reality, you know, hackers aren't going to go direct at the, you know, corporate firewall. What they're going to try to do is find a way, you know, the easier way into the network. And since, you know, a lot of the protection that the corporation may provide on the internal network isn't extracted out when, you know, employees are at hotels, coffee shops, or at home, then the easiest way is for people to provide some level of, um, you know, companies to protect their remote employees would be to actually scan that traffic before it enters the network. Um, what we've seen is a lot of companies just add an SSL VPN gateway to their network, but they actually don't scan it, scan the traffic through something as simple as their IPS system. You know, and so what we're trying to point out here is that, you know, to increase the capabilities of, you know, protection, it, it is, you know, something that we recommend to, uh, you know, scan that traffic as it's coming through, you know, and, and try to help prevent um, those threats from entering the network. Because, you know, if you spend all this money trying to protect the corporate assets, but then you don't protect the remote access employees, you know, you may be leaving yourself open or, or more vulnerable in this case. Great. Thank you for that. 
Um, another one would be to add um, strong authentication, and we've had a lot of questions about you know uh, what type of strong authentication you guys recommend. Um, you know, all of our solutions work um, with a lot of the other uh, two-factor authentication companies. We can add certificates um, in certain cases to increase the cap you know, basically the security of the network. We also have an integrated one-time password feature um, that's integrated on all of our SSL VPN solutions that provides the ability to authenticate a user via username and password, have them sent a one-time use password that has an expiration on it, and then require that in order to, to allow them to gain access. What we're just doing here is up-leveling the security. So instead of just using the standard username and password, we're basically requiring the user that is accessing the network to enter in some additional form of credential or information um, in order to provide access into that network. So again, just up-leveling the security for um, remote access. And Matt, before you move on on that, can you can you also give an example? Um, I mean, I've heard things such as like having a, a sending a text message to a cell phone or something. Is that something that is maybe one of part of that uh, integrated one-time password? So you enter your username and password, and yep. there's some mechanism to sure. So I mean, there's a couple different ways we can we can do this. So with the integrated one-time password, um, basically what ends up happening in our solution is. When the user punches in their username and password, either through the web portal or through the VPN client, basically what ends what will end up happening is we'll email them out a uh, one-time use password that they would then be required to to enter into either the web portal or SSL VPN client interface to actually gain access into the network. So we're actually requiring a second authentication mechanism in order to um, allow them into that network, um, and we can work. You know it. it there's a lot of different two-factor authentication solutions out there. So we can work with things like RSA tokens. Uh, we work with companies like Vasco and other types of either token-based or software-based um, two-factor authentication solutions. There's another interesting one, a uh, company called Phone Factor that provides a, a basically, uh, when you enter your username and password, it calls you and says, hey, you know, what's the challenge, and gives you a PIN number that you actually enter into the system. So there's a lot of different ways that uh, companies can deploy out two-factor um, authentication mechanisms to increase security uh, for the user, specifically for remote access. Very good. Thanks. All right. What I wanted to do is then just um, you know cover a couple things specific to laptops in this case for you know outside the perimeter, and I'll I'll speed through this uh, quite quickly, but kind of some some food for thought as you're deploying out. Um, laptops versus smartphones, and part of this goes back to what I originally talked about and kind of addressing some of the security issues with laptops, again, because the applications that are there are not whitelisted. Um, you know, a lot of companies want to put some additional detection capability before they allow, you know, Windows-based systems or other types of systems into the network. So in this case, the first one would be to, you know, deploy some form of endpoint control, which would actually help look and enforce the security policy for a specific organization. Again, for both managed, it could be managed or unmanaged, um, you know, laptop devices, Windows, Mac, or Linux. And really what they're trying to do is put some sort of um, company policy into saying, you know, at the very minimum, you know, you have to have some form of antivirus program, whether that be a McAfee, Symantec, or Trend Micro. You have to have a personal firewall enabled, you know, whether, again, be McAfee, Symantec, or, or um, you know, Trend Micro, or um, you know, we're going to look for a specific file that has to be uh, on that system. And if we don't find that, uh, what the SSL VPN gateway can do is basically uh, quarantine the specific user. Um, either they would allow it if the endpoint control check is um, correct. If, if not checked or it's, it's not exactly accurate, then we can quarantine the user and basically have them do some self-help remediation so that then they can you know, get allow access into the network. Or you could actually outright deny access from that specific resource. And this is important to understand because, again, depending on what type of system they're coming in from, you may have a different security policy for something like a Windows device oops, um, versus something like a iPad, for example. And so depending on the user and the type of device they're coming into or from, you could write different security policies. So you can actually up-level or down-level the access based on the security, um, as I call it, the security posture of the device. And then, again, 
fit into what your corporate policy is or your corporate mandate is for how your uh, devices are, um, you know, in terms of the acceptable usage from something like a laptop as an example. So again, very important, something just to think about as you're, um, you know, rolling out SSL VPN uh, to your user population. And so, Matt, to bring up a practical example, so this is so, you know, for instance, if I take my corporate laptop home and then I go uh, for a holiday break or something and then I end up going to my in-laws uh, and I end up using one of their machines or, like, maybe I go to a cop shop and a kiosk, I mean, so really that's kind of what you're talking about is that, you know, it's not, it's not my corporate laptop that's managed and, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it could be that, but, it, but it's also to help protect and make sure that, you know, if you do connect remotely to a network, which... Um, for all you folks out there that are on the webinar, I mean, that does happen. People are not necessarily using just corporate approved devices to connect to your network. And so consider the risk that those machines might be at when they're trying to connect to your network and, and what risks and what threats they're opening your network up to because of their ability to connect remotely. So this is kind of what that's addressing. And uh, is that, that, I believe that's correct, right, Matt? That's correct. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. And then um, I'll just run out a couple of other. You know, security things to look at. Um, the other one that we have, which is kind of interesting as well, again, from those non-IT issued systems, or in the event that people want to prevent data from accidentally, you know, in this case, sensitive data from accidentally being left behind on either, um, again, it could be managed or unmanaged systems, uh, but we have what is called a secure virtual desktop, which can be launched from Windows laptops that allows a um, it's an emulator that basically provides the same look and feel of the desktop the user is coming from, but is a secure container that prevents them from accidentally downloading content from the network, like uh, you know laundry list of social security numbers or you know credit card data or patient record files and a lot of other things that you know if the laptop is stolen or if they're working from you know home off of their own machine you don't necessarily want to leave behind because, again, you know, it is very sensitive data to the corporation. And so uh, the secure virtual desktop, again, is that uh, container that allows you to basically uh, remove all of the files that are generated during that VPN session. And upon disconnection, what will end up happening is we'll remove all those files that are there and basically remove all the remnants that that user actually accessed that VPN session so that, again, that sensitive data um, is not left behind. It's very important to understand that is that, you know, we're not providing a full what I call data leakage prevention solution, but we're really preventing the accidental um, kind of uh, breach of sensitive data being left behind on a system accidentally by the user because they clicked on something and accidentally downloaded the file directly to that system. So again, provides a, a higher level of, of protection for um, the Windows-based systems. And then finally, the last one would be a cache cleaner for the web browser. So again, I talked about this before, uh, where we have a reverse proxy that a user can go and access all the web resources. Again, using standard web browser technology like cookies and, and um, links, the cache cleaner, especially if you're coming from you know, like a coffee shop machine or from a hotel kiosk or even an airport kiosk, is that the cache cleaner can be enabled to basically remove all browsing information, including things like maybe stored usernames and passwords, as an example, if you have that option enabled. And that way, when the user either logs off or closes the browser, um, they basically, it removes all of the temporary information that's required to actually make that SSL VPN connection, in this case, using that web browser. So it's, um, again, a security concern that companies do have, and they, they want to make sure that a lot of the remnants there, especially from unmanaged systems, does not remain behind. So that somebody can't sit down at that coffee shop kiosk and basically open up the browser, go back and, and use that temporary temporary information to gain access to resources behind, um, you know, the SSL VPN gateway in this case. So one of you is just spend. I, I know we're running out of time here, but I want to spend just a couple minutes on um, kind of the, the subtle differences between SonicWalls uh, and various remote access platforms. Uh, because we have kind of what I call three distinct um, variations of this that fit into a lot of different market uh, use cases. We have uh, kind of the UTM plus SSL VPN where we have dedicated um, you know, next generation firewall devices that support um, layer three connectivity from, you know, again, Windows, Mac, Linux, uh, Windows mobile devices. Uh, what this really provides in this case is more of a network level access. So it's not really um, built or designed to have 
you know, a fully functioning web portal with all the links and bookmarks and everything else. It's just to provide uh, what I call basic, you know, network level access. Or in the case of IPsec, if you've been using that before, could be construed as a replacement for an IPsec client, um, you know, which directly connects to the firewall. And then you move to the right where we start out with our SRA platform, which is um, really geared towards, you know, quick and easy installation. It provides full uh, web-based or reverse proxy access and provides, again, the full network level access, granular policy control, and a lot of other functionality uh, that would be required to, you know, fit a lot of the security parameters that I talked about throughout the presentation. Then you move into our Aventail solution, which is a little bit higher end. Again, provides all the reverse proxy, provides network level access. But again, this is where you start breaking out into more of the endpoint control or NAC functionality. You start looking at being able to provide a secure virtual desktop environment, uh, fully functioning cache cleaner, and a lot of other security uh, types of technology. So I won't go into everything or kind of the, you know, all of the differences between the products. You can basically browse to our website and kind of uh, run through a lot of the information there um, and kind of see what the subtle differences are. But there are some significant advantages to going with one solution over the other. And we've designed the technology in these so that we can fit into a lot of different use cases where, you know, for the next generation firewall, maybe the customer just has some very basic connectivity requirements. But you start getting into more, of, you know, requirements for things like partners and customers and other types of complex deployments, you know, a low-end SRA with quick access and policy control uh, might be the right solution. And then you start getting into larger customers that need, you know, endpoint control, they need to use a secure virtual desktop, they need uh, more complex configuration. I need to start looking at, you know, our Aventail solution. So, again, we're very successful fitting into uh, the two distinct markets for SSL VPN. What I wanted to do was uh, just round out this afternoon's conversation and talk about a recent uh, news that we had uh, where we actually introduced Mobile Connect for iOS, which is our new SSL VPN client uh, designed for iOS specifically. Uh, we introduced this client about a week and a half ago. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting is that you know, it is uh, what I refer as to as a unified client, so it provides basic connectivity or network level connectivity to our E-class appliances, our SRA, our next generation firewall um, appliances. It's downloadable directly from the App Store. Uh, the client would be installed uh, directly, you know, through the App Store process. The user would then go ahead and configure an SSL VPN um, connection. So whether they're coming to our Aventail SSL VPN, SRA, or next generation firewall, um, it'll basically just set the policy and provide them the configuration options that they would need uh, in order to, you know, connect up from their iOS-enabled device. The nice thing is it's a full layer, layer three or network level client, so they have uh, the capability here to, um, you know, basically do anything they would do from iOS that's supported um, in within that OS. You know, specifically things like, you know, email, file access. Um, virtual desktop infrastructure like RDP access as well. And so there's a lot of different things that customers now can do securely from, you know, iOS-enabled devices. Um, again, just kind of a high-level view of what the user experience would be after they download and install the client. They basically define um, a gateway or profile. They would select, in this case, for the album tail, the realm, input a username and password, and then basically uh, the connection would be established at that point. Uh, to the SSL VPN gateway. So it was designed to be very easy for a user to input that information. And then again, the next time they want to connect, they hit connect, basically walk through the process, and they're connected into uh, that network as well. This is what it looks like for the um, you know, SRA next generation firewall. Same type of concept. They would define the profile for the SRA or NGFW, input the username and password, and then you know, hit connect. So again, just a quick three-step process. Uh, that the user would have to go through in order to um, support connectivity uh, back through the appliance. So, um, and then just to round out, uh, hey Matt. So, if we could, before we go, move on to um, you know, worried about uh, some of the licensing stuff. There's a couple questions that came out. Um, one um, uh, was about whether or not I know you mentioned Android in the beginning of the presentation. There's a question about. Um, uh, whether or not the when, when is an Android app coming out, or is that is that in the works, or what's the what's the plan? Sure. Uh, so we actually have um, 
you know, to put, it, put this in kind of high level, is we actually have a client for the, the Android platform for the Aventail solution. It's called uh, Connect Mobile. It is available via Android, so if you go to the Android Marketplace today and type in SonicWall, you'll see that there's an Aventail Connect client that is available uh, that will provide connectivity access back through to, you. Um, in this case, our Aventail appliances. It looks a little bit different than this client. It was built off um, some different technology. We do also have what is called Net Extender that will provide connectivity to the SRA um, next generation firewalls. Um, however, the Net Extender variant does require the phone or the Android platform to be rooted or have root access in order to install um, that specific variant of client. However, what SonicWall is actively working on, which should be available towards the beginning part of 2012, um, is, a, is Mobile Connect for iOS, or sorry, Mobile Connect for Android 4.0, which is the latest version of the Android operating system. Um, in the previous variants, which would include Gingerbread and Below, uh, Google didn't provide any kind of API that we could program a full-blown uh, network-level client like we have done for iOS. And so um, in our discussions with them over the past, you know, 18 months, as part of their 4.0 release, they've actually provided SonicWall and API and others, an API that, that, would, that will allow us to program a client that does not require root access. So in the early part of 2012, what you'll see is that we'll make available a Mobile Connect option for um, iOS as well. Uh, again, that won't require root access, but will require that you have a phone that can run uh, the Android 4.0 operating system and above. So, um, we are actively working on that. We do have a solution in place today, but we're working on bringing a larger solution to market here in the future um, for Android specifically. Gotcha. Okay, so thanks for that. Um, the other thing that, uh, another question that came up from the audience is, um, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, I think one of your slides showed that this can connect, this, uh, this will enable mobile connectivity to nearly any SonicWall devices, this, and it applies to not only the older SSL VPN 200s or the, the, the SSL VPN appliances, the new appliances, but also TZ firewalls. Uh, yeah. You know, someone has a TZ 200 or 210. Um, yeah, so as long as they're running, in this case, one of the things that we did, um, and all this is documented when you download the app, is that it'll work with pretty much any of the later variants of our SSL VPN solutions and also any of the um, next generation firewalls that can run 580 or 581 and higher. So anything that runs um, the SSL VPN code, like the TC product NSA and E-Class NSA, um, will provide connectivity. Anything that we consider Gen 4, like the pros and older TCs that don't have SSL VPN capability, uh, then this will not be supported for those specific platforms. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. Um, so, and then, so part of that, the Android question, going back really quick, um, you, you basically said that, that should be available based on what the API being available. That Sonic was working on that and expected to be out Q1 next year. Yes, yeah, so exactly. part of the question. Answer the question. Yeah. Okay, the bigger challenge for us right now is that the phones that support the 4.0 operating system are just coming online. So the availability in specifically in North America is pretty low at the moment. And so what we're we're doing is finalizing the actual development of the client uh, here for the remainder of the year looking to do a beta in the early part of Q1, <coughs> and then we'll actually launch the client out uh, to a wider audience as more and more phones you know, become available and more phones that exist in the marketplace get upgraded. Gotcha. Okay. And I, I just want to add a side note. This is more of a, uh, a, an aside from the Sonical part of it, but definitely from a, a, you know, definitely in line with enabling the mobile workforce um, that's been a recent um, addition to uh, MyTech. Uh, my tech certifications and, and abilities is, is, for instance, we've actually recently gotten certified with Apple for the Apple Consultants Network, uh, which means there's a product out there called the Mobile Device Manager, which basically can enable um, a centralized management of mobile devices such as iPads and iPhones, um, so that, as you know, from an IT perspective, if you're trying to manage that, or from a security perspective, you're concerned about people's personal iPads and iPhones having connectivity to your network, we can actually put in something that's called, again, the Mobile Device Manager that can help uh, enable that. So that's something that uh, has come up a lot recently, and I thought it would be appropriate just to note um, while we're talking specifically about iPads and iPhone connectivity at this moment. So, 
So thanks for those questions. Keep them coming if there's any more. Uh, I think there's a couple more here, but go ahead, to, uh, Matt, and continue with the slide, and then I'll interject with another question here as I get to read a few, a few more of them. No problem. I think I'm actually on my last slide, but I just want to leave you guys with, um, you know, just kind of some food for thought as we enter into the, you know, winter time frame here in, in North America, is that we do have what we call spike license capability uh, for all of our um, SSL VPN appliances. What this is designed to do is be a temporary user uh, license to increase the capacity of the physical devices that you may have deployed um, out in the marketplace. And the reason we have this is in the event of like a snowstorm, power outage, um, strike, any kind of um, quote unquote disaster that may happen that your employees can't get to work and you don't necessarily have enough concurrent user licensing capability off your physical SSL VPN appliance, you can use the spike license to temporarily increase the capacity in the event of an emergency so that your employees can still be productive working from home um, and you don't have to basically go and spend a bunch of money buying concurrent user licenses. These are um, in certain cases either 10-day licenses or 30-day license increments that you can turn on and off on your appliance as needed to fit within you know the realm of kind of the disaster recovery or you know in case of emergency situation. So I just want to leave you guys with that as we move into you know, this time during the year that I know, you know, in certain cases, parts of the East Coast and Midwest have been shut down over the past couple of years, and we've seen, you know, a very big increase in people, you know, wanting to basically purchase this, um, you know, for their SSL VPN appliances. And as I mentioned, you can buy the license, load it onto the device, and it's there for you, and it's just a matter of turning the license on and off um, in the UI. Um, so it's not like you'll, you, you know, you can purchase this when the actual emergency happens. You could have this ready to go, and basically in the event of emergency, you have the capability to turn this on or off. So with that, I'll open it up to any other questions you guys may have, um, and then kind of turn it back over to Nate uh, to do kind of a, a management of the questions that come in. Uh, very good. So as I know, um, one of the other questions that uh, we had was, you know, if you can elaborate on and try and keep it as maybe as, as uh, practical of an answer as possible as far as why would an organization, you know, we talked about a couple different things, you know, mobiles and laptops, et cetera, but connecting to uh, an SSL VPN appliance that's dedicated for, really for SSL VPN versus, you know, maybe one of the firewalls they have that also has some similar capability. Sure. What would be maybe a couple of the, the reasons why you would choose one versus the other? So a lot of that would have to do, um, you know, as I kind of alluded to uh, earlier in the presentation, you know, the, on the firewall side, what we've really put in from SS, the SSL VPN capability is really the uh, functionality to allow layer three network connectivity. So in this case, it's more of a client-based um, access into the network where they're not the user from the user experience is not really going to leverage a web portal in this case. They're just going to launch a client from their desktop like they would, you know, their IPsec client as an example, um, and gain access into the network. And that's fine for some people. Again, where you're going to run into issues on that is scalability, um, you know, on the firewalls themselves. We max out at the moment about 50 concurrent users, give or take. Um, but where you're really going to have an advantage is if you want to allow, you know, uh, companies like business partners and other contractors to come inbound to the network, in which case, to simplify the deployment, you could use one of our dedicated SSL VPN gateways and simply set up a web portal and limit their access to, to the different resources they may want to access. So you may, for example, want to allow them to get into the, an agile system to do some sort of um, corporate cooperative design or to a SharePoint server, but you don't want to give them full-blown network access. So what you do in that case is you would set up the web portal with different look and uh, basically allow them to only see those specific um, links within the, uh, you know, within the web portal view. And then further from there, if you wanted to, you can enforce using the Aventail some endpoint control uh, functionality and other types of advanced features not found in you know, the lower end of the SSL VPN. Uh, gateway, but from a very high level, that's kind of the subtle differences that you would see. So, so the main component is that that the, if you're connecting through the firewall, you're really giving full-blown VPN access, and you're not really able to restrict the type of content that the the end the remote user can connect to. Whereas, if you use the SSL VPN appliance, you can give that same unfettered access or you can actually then restrict it based on specific file shares or other, or other Exactly. 
and you can modify, you know, what they see, um, you know, when the user comes into the into the actual the web portal itself. So depending on who they are, and if you take it even further and add endpoint control, we can then limit what they see based even on the device that they come in from. So there's a lot of uh, deployment options using an SSL VPN gateway that make it easier for companies to um, say not only provide support for their own internal employees but also to provide support to their partners and, you know and other people that may need access to a specific set or a specific resource within the network and a lot of it too is that if you're working with again business partners or other companies they may not want you to install a full-blown SSL VPN client in this case or even well, from a, a user standpoint if the user is coming in from a home machine, you may not want, or they may not want to install, you know, a client piece of software onto that system. They may only want to, um, you know, come through the web portal directly, uh, so that they don't need to, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, use that client specifically from that machine. You know, that's not sure. IT issued in this case. Yeah. Well, that sounds good. Well, thank you for uh, for all that content, and the presentation, Matt. Um, uh, I'm gonna we're two minutes over schedule, so I apologize everyone for being a couple a little bit a couple minutes late. But uh, just to let you know, this uh, session's been recorded. We will upload it to our website, and uh, someone from MyTech will be following up with everyone on the attendee list um, uh, here uh, after the presentation, just to make sure you have all your questions answered. But I want to say thank you very much, Matt, for your time and for your expertise um, and for sharing all this with us. And thank you all the attendees for coming and spending 45 minutes with us. And uh, look forward to connecting with you all soon. Have a happy holiday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.